Good morning, everybody, and welcome to this special Endeavor Live broadcast as we chat with you this morning uh, live about uh, the RV or research vessel Endeavor uh, as it comes back into dock uh, at the Graduate School of Oceanography's Pier in Narragansett. Good morning, everybody, and welcome to this special. Um, and we're going to learn a little bit about the ship, uh, the recent expedition that's actually going to be wrapping up or that is wrapping up, and then answer, go to you all, uh, your questions to answer your questions about ocean science. Uh, and research that's actually conducted on ships uh, just like the Endeavor. Uh, my name is Holly Morin, uh, and I am a marine biologist and education specialist with the University of Rhode Island's Inner Space Center, which is at uh, the Graduate School of Oceanography, or GSO. Uh, if you're familiar with Rhode Island broadcasting, I'm gonna do my best Frank Coletta, and salute you all with uh, my coffee and raise my morning coffee to you. So cheers, good morning to you all. Thank you for joining us. Uh, I've actually sailed on the, the RV Endeavor. And if you've tuned in with us before with the um, GSO or with the Inner Space Center, we've actually been connected from the Arctic uh, and even the Antarctic last year. And today I'm coming to you live from the very remote location of my home office. Um, I actually sincerely hope that you and your loved ones are safe and remain healthy uh, during these current COVID-19 events. And even though the logistics of this broadcast are a little bit different than how we usually run things uh, through the Inner Space Center, we're really gonna make it as interactive as possible and go to you all for your questions. Uh, you can type them in uh, right there on the Facebook Live feed in the comments sections. Uh, any questions that you might have, um, we'll try to get to many of those as we can today for sure. Uh, the other thing that we're uh, keeping the same is we're connecting all of you with experts in the field. Uh, so this morning I'm actually joined uh, by the University of Rhode Island's uh, professor and GSO Associate Dean, Dr. David Smith. Uh, and he's also sailed out on the Endeavor multiple times as well as a whole host of other research vessels. Um, so David, why don't you say hello to everybody uh, and let them know a little bit more about your research and then the, the work that you do at GSO. Sure. Yeah. Good morning, Holly and everybody else. Uh, yeah, I'm David Smith. And yeah, I've, uh, my specialty within oceanography is I, I focus more on uh, microbial end of things. I look at how bacteria and viruses fit into the uh, 5G chemical cycles, how they, they fit in and uh, make the ocean work as a, um, as a biogeochemical system. I spent uh, probably uh, close to 800 days at sea now on um, uh, I'm not sure how many different vessels, but it's certainly uh, my favorite part of the job. And I look forward to going out uh, always. Awesome. Thanks, David. So the research vessel uh, Endeavor is a 185 foot uh, research vessel um, ship. And hopefully we'll see it come into the frame. I think what you all are looking at right now is actually um, a webcam, a live feed that we have at GSO um, that's looking out into the bay. And so hopefully we'll see the um, the ship come into frame and then it'll actually swing around and come into the pier there to dock. Um, and so the uh, Endeavor was actually built in 1975 and it's owned by the National Science Foundation or NSF. Uh, it's operated by GSO um, at URI but it, and it's home ported in Narragansett but it's actually scheduled by um, an outfit called UNALS. And David, why don't uh, you let folks know what UNALS actually stands for um, and how the ship is connected to UNALS and that it's not just GSO scientists then that are going out on the vessel itself. Right, so the UNAL stands for University National Oceanographic Laboratory System. And sorry, I had to keep looking at that. As long as I've worked with UNALS, I, I find that a little bit of a hard acronym for me. Uh, it's basically a uh, consortium consisting of 59 academic organizations around the country that operates uh, 18 vessels ranging from uh, global class vessels, these are vessels that travel all around the world. They typically don't come back to any single port, but they just uh, operate in various regions for a certain time and then move on. And then we have uh, a, a more intermediate class like the in, in Endeavor, which is home ported, as Holly said, right here in Narragansett at the pier that you're looking at. And then um, Endeavor works mostly in the North Atlantic, sometimes the Mediterranean, sometimes the Gulf of Mexico, but it, it's it, typically stays around in the uh, North Atlantic. And so then we have some other coastal vessels that are much more restricted in their, their ability to uh, how much time they can stay at sea. Um, and so that limits their range. Uh, the way this works is that uh, scientists put in proposals. They get, uh, they put in a proposal, they have uh, what they think is a good idea and submit the proposal to a funding agency like National Science Foundation, Office of Naval Research, 
uh, et cetera. When those, uh, and then those review, those uh, proposals will get reviewed by uh, their peers around the country, people that understand the type of work that they're proposing to do. And they'll comment on what they think the significance of that work is. And if the proposals uh, is, is reviewed positively by enough people, then um, the uh, funding agency will decide whether to fund it or not. And if they, if they do fund it, and part of the proposal is saying, in order to do this work, excuse me, in order to do this work, I need a certain, I, I need a, a ship with a certain amount of uh, capabilities and I need to be in this location. And it doesn't matter uh, where the scientist works. Uh, the scientist could be uh, out at the University of Washington on the West Coast, but they, they may want to do a project in the Atlantic. And so uh, if that proposal is, is uh, positively reviewed and funded, then it goes to the UNALS group to schedule it. And, and so there, this group looks at all the proposals that are funded, say, for a given year, uh, what type of work they want to do, what capabilities the ship has, has to have, whether it's how far, how long the ship can stay out, how big the, the frame is, meaning how big equipment can be deployed, um, or you know, where the ship is, is located. And so then the, the scientists will mobilize, uh, fly to the, to the ship, and then do their work out there. And so uh, as a ship operator, uh, the Graduate School of Oceanography uh, is responsible for operating uh, our, the research vessel Endeavor. And so whatever science is funded on that, regardless of where the person uh, has their, um, their job, um, we are in charge of making sure Endeavor can support that type of work. And just uh, uh, kind of a, a side point there is just, uh, just because I work at the University of Rhode Island, I, I don't have any um, uh, uh, what priority over getting the ship to get to use the Endeavor. I have to go through that same process, get my uh, proposals funded. And then if the Endeavor is the proper ship to use, then I'll get schedules on the Endeavor. If uh, I still do work in the Pacific, then uh, I will be uh, assigned a ship out on the West Coast. Great, thanks, David. I just wanna remind everybody as you know, we're, we're chatting about things um, to definitely type in your questions um, and we're gonna get to that in just a few minutes, but keep them coming if you have any questions. Hopefully some coffee has gotten things percolated in your brains, or if you have your kids with you, I'm sure they may have already been up and their brains are already going. I have two young ones, so I completely know how that goes. I think it's really interesting to share with folks though that when you made the comment, David, that it's not just GSO scientists that necessarily have priority because the ship is there. And then the different capabilities that you need or that you're looking to that you have to list when you're actually applying to do your research and use the vessels in the UNALS fleet. So when you're looking at the Endeavor specifically then and, and its capabilities, how many people can fit on the ship at one time? So uh, Endeavor being this intermediate class uh, vessel, that can uh, hold up to 30 people. And uh, 30 includes the crew uh, and as well as the scientists. And so there's a set number on the, on the crew that has to sail and then, um, what each each cruise has what's called a chief scientist. That scientist is someone who uh, typically uh, took the lead in the proposal and had the uh, basic idea, and then they assemble the team uh, that they need to conduct that work. And so um, they'll bring in scientists, uh, and these scientists will include their their graduate students, uh, sometimes undergraduate students. I've had undergraduate students go out with me. Uh, and then once that team is assembled, and you say, okay, I've got enough people to conduct the work that I promised that I would do, uh, typically then we'll open up any empty bunks to other people that are just um, looking to get some experience at sea or maybe uh, are, um, uh, you know, maybe a little tangential to the project, but can come out and lend a hand in deploying and retrieving equipment, but also uh, maybe get some samples for themselves. So the Endeavor holds 30. Uh, one ship I work on, the one I guess I've been on the most, is a very big ship and we have 125 people on that. Uh, and that one stays out for two months at a time. Awesome, and I know that we were just sharing the uh, the tour that we have of the um, 
of the endeavor. And we'll get back to that, I think, and we can talk about some of those spaces that were being shown. And I, but the, I think it's one of our fast facts that we have about the endeavor is how many people it can hold. So 30 people, and it's not just scientists. Y'all want to remember that. It's actually 12 crew members, um, 17 science team members, and then a marine technician. A marine technician is the person who's responsible for helping get all the gear and the equipment over the side, um, help with your data and other things as well. So um, uh, it's not just uh, scientists or is that the crew that's operating the ship as well um, that's on board. So I think we're going to go to a few of your questions right now before we chat about the actual inner workings of the endeavor and go through that tour video again. Um, David, uh, Kathleen Carr has asked, uh, what's the most memorable mission that you've been on uh, with the RV Endeavor? I have only been on a few where I've been out mm -hmm. sailing um, with um, Chris Orfanides, <clears throat> the graduate student at GSO and also works at the National Marine Fisheries Lab and Melissa Oman's group, uh, looking at for right whales and looking at their interactions with uh, the, the plankton in the area. And I know my most memorable moment was as somebody who's a marine mammal biologist, um, I had never actually seen a right whale, which they all thought was hysterical. I used to work on managing right whales. And the very first cruise I went out on, we didn't see any whales and everybody was bummed until the very last day, um, right around dinner. And I can tell you that I skipped dinner because I just sat up on the flying bridge with Chris and watched you know, the right whales that we had that we were tracking. And it was just a great moment. But for you, what, what's your most memorable moment on the RV Endeavor? Yeah, that's, that's a good uh, question. Um, maybe, I, maybe it's because it was my uh, most recent experience on the Endeavor. Uh, uh, but we were working in what's uh, called the Puerto Rico Trench. So in this case here, Endeavor was working down uh, in the southern part of the uh, North Atlantic, and we flew into San Juan, Puerto Rico, and got on the uh, got on the ship there. And then just just north of the uh, island is a trench. Uh, there's the, the plate tectonics in the area. There there's a subduction zone there, and created this trench that is um, about twenty five thousand feet deep or 8,400 meters. I didn't uh, do the translation there. I know it's 8,400 meters. So very deep. And I was working with colleagues uh, from GSO. Uh, Stephen Daunt was the chief scientist this time, uh, and Chris Roman, another professor. Uh, so uh, there's a big team of us, uh, Rob, who's on the ship now. Uh, Chris developed a, a, what's called an autonomous um, water sampler. Uh, basically, for years and years, what we've done is to have a package that's on a wire and we lower it from the ship and we can control it, we can see what's happening with it. But in this case, the water's so deep there, uh, we didn't want to, uh, I'd say what, uh, take all the time to lower it and, and, and retrieve it. So Chris made one that actually um, we can drop it overboard and it's totally disconnected from the ship and it sinks and it sinks all the way down to the bottom and then sat down in the trench and then Chris was able to send uh, an acoustic signal. He had a, uh, a, a little thing he put in the water that just made a sound at a certain wavelength and um, a certain frequency, and it uh, caused the uh, package to release a weight, and then it floated back up to the top. It was collecting data as uh, it was coming back up, and then it would close the sample bottles on the way up based on what the computer was telling it as it was rising. And then the most amazing thing was um, when we uh, it's outfitted with a radar reflector and flashing lights and beacons and that, so we can find it when it gets back up to the surface. But uh, in our very first deployment, I was standing out on deck when uh, it came back up to the surface and I could see it, it, it came within 10 feet of the ship. Uh, maybe a little too close uh, for, for our liking, but uh, uh, that, was, that was really very impressive, I thought. Awesome, thanks, David. So, um, <clears throat> excuse me, another one of our fast facts about the Endeavor is that she's actually taken over 650 uh, research cruises. And between the work that I was talking about where I was looking at right whales uh, with folks here at GSO and National Marine Fisheries um, in Narragansett Bay or, or close to Cape Cod, and then David was down looking at the, the Chromatic Trench, um, we mentioned that the, the vessel does have quite a range. Um, it can go up to 8,000 miles at 12 knots or 14 miles per hour, the fastest speed or its max speed is 16 miles per hour and actually has a fuel capacity to last about uh, 30 days. And then another interesting fast fact, uh, the chef on board who I can say they cook, cook fantastic meals. It's always an important uh, position on a boat, keeps everybody happy. Um, so in the galley, it's a, a relatively small galley but they can actually make three full meals uh, for up to 30 days for everybody that's on board the boat. Uh, so not only do you have the gas, you have the regular fuel but all the other food fuel as well for everybody that's on board. 
Um, so the current expedition, they were actually down in the tropical uh, Atlantic, <clears throat> excuse me. And so it's Reiner Lohmann's group. Uh, he is a professor here uh, at GSO uh, who specializes in marine and atmospheric chemistry. And you mentioned uh, Rob Bacolny is also on there. He's co-PI on this, uh, the research project that is actually titled Concentrations in Source Assessment of Black Carbon Across Tropical Atlantic Air and Sediment, which is actually a really concise title uh, to what this group is looking at um, in their research down in the tropical Atlantic um, so they were uh, looking at something called black carbon. Now, I'll be honest, I'm a marine mammal biologist, so this is not necessarily my wheelhouse. It's fantastic to have David here with me. But from what I understand that black carbon is, is it's a result of incomplete burning of fuel. So it's something that doesn't degrade easily in the environment, can be transported long distances, and it can even reach the seafloor. Um, and but. It, not much is known about the flux between this black carbon in the environment, between the atmosphere, between the ocean, et cetera. So that's what this study was really trying to look at. They were looking at if there are fires, uh, wildfires happening in Africa, if that's a source of this black carbon to the tropical Atlantic, um, as well as looking at some other things that might be there in the water column and the atmosphere as well. Um, and so it was really interesting, I think, what they were doing and how to research this. They were using tools during this three week research cruise uh, on board to sample the sediment uh, thousands of meters uh, below uh, the sea, you know, down the seafloor. Uh, but they were also using instruments on board to sample the atmosphere at the same time. So they were kind of getting, it sounded like to me at least, concurrent measurements uh, to look at that flux that is kind of unknown in the system. So David, could you speak a little bit more? I know uh, what we're showing here is a multi-core, which is one of the tools they were using on board, uh, and speak to a little bit about how this tool operates uh, and how it was important to this research um, and anything else you'd like to share your insight about, you know, black carbon and why it's important to be doing this work. Yeah, sure. So what, what, uh, what you're looking at there on the, on the deck of the ship there is, is what's called a multi-core. And if you look down, like uh, the, the guy with his back to you with the, the shorts on, uh, down by his knees, you see some tubes. Uh, this is a, uh, uh, the multi-core. There are eight of these plastic sleeves that uh, are arranged around a carousel in the, in the center of that frame there. And then uh, the guy who's uh, standing up on it, that's, that's the bosun. Uh, he's, his, his role is essentially the, the deck boss. He makes sure that the equipment is ready to go. He makes sure that all the scientists are operating safely. And um, uh, uh, he, he is really responsible for uh, getting the gear uh, ready and over the side. And so this one is on a retrieval here because you can see some sediment inside the tubes there. You see the little brown in the sediment tubes. And so what happens here is that this, uh, uh, these tubes go down, um, what we call is cock, the, the bottom is pulled out on the side there. And so it's, it's free to, the water will flow through as this thing is being lowered down through the water column, water's flowing through the tube freely. And then um, you can see some lead weights in the middle there. And that's used to, once the system hits the seafloor, the tension is released from the wire and the lead weights then push the, those eight tubes into the sediment below. And then as we pull it back up, those arms that were cocked out of the way while the uh, things were going down, these little uh, feet just go underneath and hold the sediment from, on, from below. And then it's brought back up on board. Uh, the black carbon, uh, what Reiner's really interested in is looking at um, carbon budgets. We often think about when we burn fossil fuels, say we, we think that uh, we take the, you know, take the gasoline in your car and it gets converted to CO2 and goes back into the atmosphere. And we're really, you know, concerned about that as it relates to global warming. But not all that gasoline gets converted directly to carbon dioxide. All, all you have to do is look at the exhaust pipe on your car and you see that black film that's around there. Well, that's the black carbon. That's the example for, for a car. But the same thing happens uh, when uh, people are burning um, uh, fuel on land, uh, uh, like trees and such, as they're clearing land for farming and that sort of practice, that uh, combustion is inc incomplete. A lot of the carbon goes into CO2, but some of it stays in this black carbon um, that then gets transported out over the atmosphere, in the atmosphere over the ocean. And so Reiner and his group has uh, air samplers. Uh, we typically put those very high up on the ship uh, up front so it doesn't get um, contaminated by the combustion of the ship itself. And he has pumps in there that pumps air through essentially these sponges that then he'll extract later on to measure how much black carbon is in the atmosphere. 
And then he's also looking in the seafloor, uh, how much is actually making it all the way down to the seafloor and, and being sequestered in the seafloor. And so one of the things that he's really interested in is how much of this carbon, you know, instead of thinking about all the carbon being combusted and being turned into CO2, how much actually gets converted to this black carbon that then can be sequestered and stored for long periods of time in the seafloor. And so one of the things that as we take those cores, the further down you go in the core, the older that sediment is. And so he can look at changes in how black carbon has reached the seafloor and been sequestered in the seafloor over periods of time. Awesome. Thanks, David, so very much for um, explaining all of that. That was perfect. And I love that we had those images of a multi-core because it's just one of those things where not everybody gets to go out on a research yeah. vessel and see all these tools. Um, and it's great that that's actually one of the instruments that they were using uh, during the cruise. I want to remind everybody, if you have questions, no matter what they might be, uh, feel free to ask them. And actually, David, we have uh, Jackson, who's age eight. He wants to know um, that uh, what is the coolest sea creature that has ever been uh, seen on the ship. And so I don't know if you've done yep. any benthic deployments, because I know those usually bring yeah. up fairly interesting things. Yeah, that's a that's a uh, that's a good question, Jackson. I I, um, uh, I usually work with uh, water samples and and sediment samples, and so uh, maybe uh, I'm probably not the best one, but I have been out on ones where we do trawls, and uh, my um, my personal favorites are the squid, but then um, we eat them. Uh, Mike does a great job of cooking them up on. So if we we, we catch some squid, we'll eat them right then. Um, uh, yeah, so I guess that's my favorite, the squid. Yeah, when I've been out before, um, and we've been, I know I've done out on the on the Captain Burt, which is the smaller vessel that we do the fish trawls with. It's not necessarily the Endeavor, but I always like it when we bring up, it's always fascinating when you bring up a really big fish and you know, I know that's kind of cliche, you know, it was this big. But you know, when you bring up a huge flounder and you know that it's been surviving for that long and it's gotten to reach that size and it's really impressive when you catch a fish that is that big. I know we brought up a flounder before and it's really fascinating when you get really large spider crabs um, that have the huge arms and um, they are, they're always great to have. But I know in, in watching other uh, cruises, there's lots of just fascinating animals that live in the deep sea. Um, when you're looking at things like with remotely operated vehicles that we've kind of streamed that data now, the Endeavor doesn't have a remotely operated vehicle, not a big one like we think of on the ships like the Okeanos or the Nautilus, um, but they've seen some pretty fascinating creatures, mm -hmm. giant isopods, um, really crazy looking fish, um, that have uh, crazy teeth, um, angler fish. Um, I know that the frog fish always look so grumpy whenever they find one of those and can walk along the seafloor. So lots of really um, interesting things that live in the ocean. A lot of things we don't simply know about, uh, which is why it makes the work that Reiner's doing, that you do, that a lot of oceanographers, all of them are doing so very important. Um, again, if you all have questions out there in Facebook, keep typing those in. They're actually being filtered to me. Um, so I'm able to see them. But I think, David, what might be great is actually if we bring up that tour video again and kind of talk about the different spaces mm -hmm. that make Endeavor um, special and how uh, people are able to move between these spaces, the research labs, uh, what the where they sleep. Um, I know people are always mm -hmm. asking where they eat. So here's the tour video. I'm going to let you actually do the uh, parade narration. OK, so this is the main lab and this is in between cruises. You know, it looks very empty and that's one of the um, uh, and, okay, and here we're looking at the bank of equipment that stays on the ship all the time. And this gives data on heading and, and that. This is the wet lab. Uh, this is where we try to keep things that are a little, uh, you know, very muddy and, and, and this we can just spray down with a hose and, and uh, clean this out. So that's, a, that's the uh, wet lab. Uh, here's, here's another view of the same lab from the other, other angle. Uh, here we have uh, sinks. Uh, that th those equipment in the corner there are underway gear. Uh, this is the uh, more of the clean lab, the chemistry lab. We try to isolate things if we're using chemicals in there that need to be uh, controlled in terms of uh, maintaining the fumes and that. Those are freezers for storing samples. Uh, here's a typical cabin. Uh, you see the bunk beds in there. Uh, people, uh, there's like two of everything in there: two beds, two lockers. Um, there's a head in there. That's the lounge. Uh, if you have some free time, you can just hang out there, right? Typically after a meal. Here's the very small gym, has a stationary bike and a weightlift. Here's the mess. Here's the kitchen. Here's where uh, uh, Mike makes us uh, the meals. There, it's actually very good. And here's where we eat it. And one one thing of the uh, here is that the um, 
uh, I'll get back to that. Here is the uh, view of the main deck. And you see the A-frame there, that big white uh, structure in the rear. That dictates how big of equipment can be deployed uh, off the ship. And so some ships have much bigger ones, uh, some have some smaller ones. Uh, that's a water collecting device there, the CTD rosette. Uh, here's uh, one of the cranes. There you see the rescue boat in case uh, you have to do something off. Here's the bridge. It's where the captain and his mates control the ship. David, can I interrupt you really quickly? Sure. This is actually perfect where the captain's showing the bridge. I think actually the captain is bringing uh, the Endeavor. I just got a note right back yep. into port. So if we go back to that yep. live stream and switch, we'll be able to see the Endeavor coming into port, which is always great. Um, I know usually when the Endeavor, when she leaves the GSO pier, there she is. Yeah coming in and when she arrives, there's usually actually a team of, uh, of us that will be there that welcome her back and obviously will also see her off. So things are a little bit different uh, right now. But uh, so David, what happens uh, when usually when a ship comes in? I know mobilization is when all of your gear gets put onto a vessel yeah. beforehand. So what's the usual protocol for when the ship comes in? And is it a very easy process actually for the ship to navigate uh, alongside the pier here? Uh, not particularly, this is, this is a, um... Uh, this is the tricky part here. As a, as a ship, when we first came on, you saw the ship heading north. For reference, that's the uh, Pell Bridge, the Newport Bridge up there, and then uh, the pier at the Bay Campus there. So the ship was coming up north and loops around just short of the Jamestown Bridge in order to make this approach to the, to the pier. And now because the ship uh, is, is fairly old, it's the second oldest ship in the UNOL's fleet uh, and only by one year, um, some of the some some of the uh, equipment that the new ship will have. Hopefully, we'll get into that later. Um, this ship doesn't have, and so it's basically the captain needs to really uh, line up with the with the uh, dock there, considering the currents and the winds. Uh, they come in on a certain tide. You see, the tide is uh, fairly high there. Um, and interestingly, this is the first um, uh, Chris Ionetti, the captain on this cruise. Uh, he's been the chief mate on there on the Endeavor for many years, but he is uh, uh, serving as the captain on this cruise for the very first time. And I hear it's going extremely well. I've I've sailed with Chris uh, many times, and uh, I have uh, complete confidence in him. But what's happening now is you have people on the ship that are handling lines. They've got lines that they're going to throw, literally throw, from the ship onto the dock, and there will be people on the dock waiting to catch those uh, lines, and then they'll wrap them around. The structures there to, to, to maintain the uh, the ship in place, and so they're sort of catching it as it's floating by, and then uh, the captain will reverse the thrusters to keep it uh, in place there. And uh, I've seen this uh, sometimes; it, it hasn't worked out very well because of um, particularly if the wind is set up the wrong way, and and the, the captain has had to make multiple approaches. Uh, this looked uh, beautiful uh, on the first shot. Um, uh, and, and some of those issues will be solved with the new ship. Yeah, so why don't you talk a little bit, uh, a little bit more about the new ship, so the re uh, resolution um, that um, right. so we'll be maintaining and have, and is this, is this pier going to be big enough for that new ship? No, it's not, and, and so we have, uh, uh, they started dry, um, they started putting pilings in for the new pier, uh, my understanding, I haven't been on campus for a couple of weeks because of the virus, but uh, uh, I understand they're already working on the new pier. Uh, as you can see, there's uh, the, the pier is very uh, close to the water. There's not a lot of height, a lot of distance between the water level and the, the, the deck on the, on the dock there. And so um, our, new, our new one will not only be longer, but it'll be higher. And one of the reasons it'll, the new ship will be a little bit longer, it'll be 199 feet uh, versus the 184 of the Endeavor. So it's gonna be a little bit longer, but the key thing there is up in the bow, up in the front of the ship, there's going to be a uh, crane as well to, to handle uh, ship stores and, and parts for the engine room, that sort of thing. And so as if, if you can tell right now, it's hard to tell, but right out on the, uh, where, the, where the bow of the ship, the front of the ship is, there's just a little, uh, what we call a catwalk. It's just like a, a, a little scaffolding that the people go out and catch the lines. The new dock will be a solid dock that a forklift can drive out on, a truck can drive out there, drop gear off, and then the ship will be able to pick it up and put it on. Uh, and will the, the new ship, will it have, a, it'll have expanded capabilities? Um, it, it, it'll have um, what's called a bow thruster. 
And so that's a, uh, that'll be an engine that's in, in the front of the ship that can push it sideways. And so in this case here, the new ship won't have to go up and loop around by the Jamestown Bridge. It'll be able to just come in, flip around, and then move sideways, kind of crawl like a crab, and just butt up against the, uh, the new dock. So uh, that's going to be a real game changer for us. That just wasn't that wasn't available um, uh, when when Endeavor was built. When the ship was it built. Four wasn't years the ago. technology. <laughs> yeah. So, so yeah, I think of it. The uh, uh, when Endeavor was delivered to GSO, I was uh, the big thing for me that year is I was getting my driver's license, and so uh, I've been driving for a very long time, <laughs> and, and, and so. Uh, getting a new ship is just going to, you know, think about all the technology changes that ha have been um, made since that. Now, we've been able to keep up with a lot of things. If you look on the bridge, there's a lot of new technology up on the bridge. And so uh, a lot of things the Endeavor has been able to uh, keep up. And as, as a ship operator, uh, URI has been, um, uh, you know, that's one of our jobs is to maintain the ship and make sure it's uh, capable of, of doing the work. And so we have been able to upgrade a lot of things, but not, not something structural like that as, as, a, as a bow thruster. And so we're all quite excited about the new ship. I agree, I agree. So talking about technologies on the ship, we actually had a question that came in from Emma. Uh, she's five years old and she oh. wanted to know if the instruments that we're using um, or that are deployed off the Endeavor, if they can go as deep as those anglerfish that I mentioned. Yeah, yeah. Hi, Emma. That's that's a great question, and uh, not not everything can. And and what we have is things are what we call pressure rated, and so that uh, this instrument. And a lot of times we'll package a lot of instruments onto one one big package that we send down, and we can only send it down as deep as the uh, the most uh, shallowest rated instrument. And so it's sort of the weakest link sort of thing. And so uh, in particular, we have some things that measure light. So as we measure, as we lower uh, an instrument into the water and it's looking at how much sunlight is penetrating into the ocean, uh, those things can't go very deep, they'll get crushed. Uh, but light doesn't go very deep, so that's okay. But, unless, but if you wanna do something else, you either have to bring that back up and take it off and then put it back in. Um, but how we know these things is, is we have tanks that we can, we can test things in. We can, we can lower, or we can put an uh, instrument into a pressure tank and raise the pressure and see how, how deep it can go. And so, yeah, that's, a, that's an excellent question. It, it's, uh, um, if people who are working in very deep water take that very seriously and have to plan in advance in terms of making sure their instrument doesn't, doesn't get crushed. And then just real quick, when it comes to samples on board, um, so Reiner samples or other samples that might be taken, whether they're specimens or sediment, mm -hmm. rocks, what happens? Like, what's the process now with the boats come into dock? So what happens to any samples that have been taken? Sure. So, so it depends what kind of samples they are. Um, like his air samples, uh, I've sampled for Reiner. We were down in the South Pacific. We were in an area, uh, there's a place called Point Nemo, which is the furthest place from any land and it's down in the South Pacific. And so Reiner thought that was a very interesting place to get some samples, some air samples, to see how far these black carbons are being distributed. And so um, those samples don't require much. Um, uh, they're just, they put them in these metal cans and they stay in a box until he can get to them. Uh, samples that say I work on, um, if we're looking to um, look at e extracting some of the DNA from samples, we put them in a, uh, in a freezer that's much, much colder than the freezer that you would have in your house. It's uh, the freezer in your house is probably about minus 20 degrees centigrade. Uh, these freezers are minus 80. And so we put them in those freezers and then we have to ship them in dry ice or we bring dry ice down to the dock and transfer them to our labs. So it really, it, it's really all over the place. Uh, some of the geologists that are dredging up rocks, um, those rocks won't change, right? They can just be set out on the deck. They can sit on the dock. We have a rock repository that can hold those for, for decades and uh, there are no special requirements there. So it's really, uh, it really depends. And so that's one of the interesting things that we do is we try to do this triage or we, we set up our protocol such that if a sample is 
needs to be analyzed right away, we take that gear out on the ship so that we can, we can do it right then. Uh, and that's one of the points I want to make on a tour of the, uh, of the Endeavor is all those tables in the main lab were blank. And that's because that was in between cruises. Now, when Reiner set up for his cruise there, he brings all the equipment that he needs to analyze those samples. And we literally screw them down to the deck, uh, uh, the, uh, not to the deck, but to the, the, to the benches so that they, they won't move as the ship is moving. And so the samples that won't last, that, that we can't preserve, will get um, analyzed on board. Those that can wait, we typically store them however they have to be stored, whether that's in the refrigerator or in the freezer or just at room temperature. And then um, and depending where the cruise is, is at, now Reiner's lab is, is just up the hill from the ship there. And so he can take his samples right there. But I've gotten off of ships in all over the place, uh, Northern Norway, uh, Tahiti and, and, and New Zealand. And those samples have to get back to my lab. And so there's a very, uh, particularly like frozen ones, it's, it's, uh, there's a very sophisticated uh, distribution. We just use commercial shipping firms to get them back, back home. Awesome. Thanks, David. So uh, I think we're going to actually uh, wrap up and I wanted to thank David so much for his expertise and, and thank you all for joining us today. Hopefully you've learned a little bit about oceanographic vessels like the Endeavor uh, and the important role they still very much play uh, in ocean research. Uh, but before we go, one question I have for all of you out there on Facebook, actually, um, as our group starts to think about how we can engage folks further virtually, it'd really be helpful to know what you're interested in. So before you sign off, if you could let us know in the comment box some ideas of things that you might be interested in learning more about, that would be really um, uh, helpful to us here at GSO and the Interspace Center as well. I want to remind you all, you can follow along, watch the live cam, you can and see what happens uh, at the dock at GSO, and you can learn more about the Endeavor uh, online on its website, as well as the new ship, the Resolution has a web page as well. Uh, continue to follow along with the Interspace Center um, and uh, the University of Rhode Island's Graduate School of Oceanography on social media, um, and as well as individual websites. There's lots of places that you can go uh, for various information about all the different things that we talked about today. Um, otherwise, thank you so much again for taking the time to join us this morning. I'll give you my coffee mug here. Uh, please be safe, be well, and thank you so much again for taking the time to explore with us. We'll talk more. Bye-bye. Yeah. yeah.